try to hide and steal you away death tried to keep you inside of the grave the enemy fought you he tried but he lost you cannot be stopped when we cried for freedom you tore down the wall the weight of our burden you carried it all Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot be stopped. You're the mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing against our God we stand on your victory we shout out your praise miracle work your mighty to save awesome and power Relentless in love oh, oh, You cannot be stopped Cause you're the mover of mountains Breaker of chains Jesus is triumph Over the grave Sing hallelujah The battle is won Nothing can stand Against our God Nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. No, 
There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. We cannot be stopped. There's nothing that can stop our God. No. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is
Congrats, class of 2020, y'all did it. You're graduated now. So proud of you all and pumped to see what the Lord has for you next and praying for y'all as you go out into the world. Stay in touch, love you guys. What's up seniors, congratulations. Stepping into the new phase of life. I'm excited you guys all made it and have fun. Congrats. Congratulations, you guys are done. Um, I'm so proud of all of you, and I'm really excited to see what the Lord has in store for y'all. It's been such a joy getting to know you um, over this last year. Congratulations, seniors, on graduating. That's awesome. You are finally done with public school, and we are all so proud of you here. Um, we love you guys. I know you're going to do some great things after all this is over. Um, and I just can't wait to spend the rest of the summer with you, but then pass that here, uh, all the amazing things that you're up to. Congrats, good work. Hey church family, uh, here with my good friend Paul Anglin uh, for a really exciting announcement uh, about our church uh, moving forward. Uh, our leadership team, uh, which consists of myself and Lindsay, Andrew West, and Greg Hook, we have been praying about adding to our team over really the last year. Uh, and uh, about six months ago, we believed as a team that the Lord was inviting us to engage with Paul about the possibility of coming on to our leadership team and joining us as overseers of uh, our church family. And so uh, the announcement today is that uh, Paul has uh, entered the process with us, engaged the process, and all of us together uh, really feel a peace and a calling and a direction from the Lord for Paul to join us. And so I wanted to officially uh, welcome uh, Paul to our team uh, and tell you how excited we are about this. It's, uh, I'm very humbled uh, by this addition and excited for the future of our church to have Paul and his passion and his gifting and his experience uh, to help uh, lead our church forward. A growing church requires a growing leadership and uh, this reality of Paul joining, it is an answer uh, to a lot of prayers uh, over the last year. So I wanted you guys to get to know Paul a little bit and we'll um, uh, see Kathy here in just a minute as well. Uh, but I'm just gonna ask Paul a few questions. This is just an opportunity for you guys for those that don't know Paul, to get to know him a little bit. So, Paul, welcome. I Thanks, love you. I'm Thank you. I'm grateful for you. Uh, would you just share just some, just an overview, just a bit about yourself, your family? Um, just tell us a little bit about yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Paul Anglin. Uh, bet many of you. Uh, my wife Kathy also is here uh, with us. So Kathy and I have been in Fort Collins now for two and a half years. Uh, we moved here from Maryland. Uh, we have three adult kids. They're all. Uh, three married. One of them lives in Denver, and the other two are in Portland, Oregon. So that's kind of the big overview. Okay. Uh, just your background. I know that's um, something exciting for a lot of people to know. Like, what's what's your career path been? Yeah, so, gosh, um, I'm a commercial airline pilot, and I've been doing that now for probably 27 years. And before that, I flew in the Marine Corps for 12 years. And so that's kind of the, the big picture. Yeah, good. Um, obviously, you're stepping into a role as a spiritual uh, overseer. Uh, what are some what are some highlights? What are some a flyover, if you will? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of <laughs> that's your right. kind it's of good. journey. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Kathy and I have been married for uh, 33 years now. Um, I was not a believer when we got married, and when I left active duty, left the Marine Corps, we uh, moved to St. Augustine, Florida. And we moved in next door to a pastor. Okay. And I was a little bit concerned about that at first. In fact, our <laughs> real estate agent actually warned us, kind of, you know, prepared us for that. Um, in any event, so eventually met this family, got really connected to them, and uh, ended up visiting their church one Sunday. And that pretty much was it for me. I mean, I knew right then that uh, I had heard the gospel many times before. But that was the first time that I had, had actually heard the gospel. Um, and so really from then on, uh, Kathy and I became very connected with his family. They were our next door neighbors. And they just mentored us and shepherded us for like the next year and a half when we were in St. Augustine. So very profound time in our lives yeah. uh, actually living there. Um, so that was from St. Augustine. Uh, I got hired by Southwest Airlines. We moved to Texas. 
and then we ended up from there uh, going to Maryland and getting connected to a church there, and uh, that that's pretty much it. Okay. You guys moved to Fort Collins when? So two and a half years ago, going on three years. Okay, two and a half years ago, uh, and had been involved mm-hmm. in your church in Maryland in various um, areas yeah, of leadership there, right? right. Uh, and then got to Fort Collins, right. and we were blessed to uh, really be on the receiving end of Paul and Kathy kind of joining us at Two Rivers and partnering with us. Um, and so, just tell tell us tell everyone a little bit about just your involvement with Two Rivers. What's uh, where have you been involved? How long have you been with us? Yeah, so we uh, we were pretty involved in our church in Maryland uh, from small group leadership. Uh, um, Gosh, for the last 15 years we were there, uh, we were quite involved. And the last two years that I was there, I served as the executive pastor uh, at our church. Uh, when I came here, we really kind of throttled back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, we needed a bit of a break after several years of service. Yep. Um, so we got connected with Two Rivers and just started attending. And uh, eventually, you know, there we definitely saw a need for more you know, small groups and for us to get connected with other people uh, in a small group type setting. And so after talking with you, Jason, a little bit, we, we talked about launching a kind of an intergenerational uh, small group. And so we, we did that. And I think we've been now been participating in that group for, it's probably been less than a year. Yeah, I'm, this I'm fall you guys launched that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so life group leadership, mm-hmm. um, I know Kathy's also very involved with our nurture team and our uh, wise women um, right, as right. well. So just a lot of places of involvement. And so it was uh, one yeah. of the things that I um, have learned from people that have mentored and shepherded me over the years as a pastor is when you bring someone on in leadership at a leadership team overseer level is that uh, who's already doing that? Who's already shepherding and serving and leading? And so as our leadership team prayed for the right person to bring uh, we really believe that uh, the lord is leading us to paul and so over the last six months lots of conversations lots of prayer um, space for the lord to confirm uh, we are so excited to kind of officially commission uh, paul uh, on our team as one of your pastors as one of your overseers and it's uh, really uh, a blessing for us Um, and so, Paul, last question, and I want to pray for you and Kathy. What, what are some ways that uh, people in our church can pray for you yeah, yeah. as you step into uh, yeah. this role with us on our leadership team? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the first thing, obviously, is in this role, um, I think wisdom, obviously, is going to be very important. Uh, I think one other thing that's really important is just, just the ability to listen well, listen well and, and hear from people uh, and really uh, do that with a heart of understanding and a heart of love. So I think those are probably a couple of the big things there. Wonderful. So just, yeah. And I would invite you to please pray <coughs> for our leadership team often. We need your prayers uh, as we uh, lead forward in really this um, season of life, this journey that we're in right now. Lots of wisdom. Pray for our unity uh, together. Uh, and we just want you to know that you have full access Uh, to us as your leaders Um, and we love you and uh, it's a privilege for us it's a holy privilege Uh, it's a humbling privilege Mm -hmm. uh, to serve uh, in this way so uh, Paul I'm excited about the future of our church I'm so glad uh, that you're here I'm so thankful for your bride and her full support and also feeling called so I want to just invite Kathy on the screen so you guys can see her and then I'm going to pray a blessing uh, over you guys okay thank you so Kathy if you'll come and Join us. This is Kathy, everyone. And uh, let me pray uh, for Paul and Kathy. Lord, we are so humbled. We're grateful um, that you uh, gift people by your grace and you stir them in purpose uh, and calling and direction. Thank you for uh, Paul and Kathy. Thank you for their uh, leadership uh, in their life group. Um, Thank you for the process that you have Uh, brought our leadership team through. Um, Lord, thank you for the unity uh, that we feel. Thank you that you have made this very clear both to us and to Paul and Kathy that this is the next step for our church. And so, Lord, we we commission Paul as uh, an overseer of our church. Uh, Lord, would you um, bring him wisdom and guidance, um, listening, 
unity with us as we uh, discern uh, your direction. Lord, we, we want to follow your leadership, your calling, your purpose, your direction for Two Rivers Church. And so, Lord, we want to be faithful servants uh, in following you and shepherding uh, this church well. Um, Lord, we bless you for this uh, reality. Um, and we uh, thank you for your grace upon grace that empowers uh, our work as we uh, walk in the vision and the mission that you have called us to follow. We bless your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Jason. All right, so if you could turn now uh, in your Bibles to Mark uh, chapter 11 as we continue this uh, journey through the gospel according uh, to Mark. Our passage today, we'll pick up today right where Jody left off uh, last week. Uh, so our text is uh, verses 12 to 25, Mark 11, 12 to 25, and the uh, title of our message today is uh, denunciation. If you look up denunciation uh, in the dictionary, you'll find that the definition means a public condemnation of something or someone. Uh, and I would uh, say to all of you as we get into this today um, that this is a really important text um, and our understanding of New Covenant theology. And so I'm excited to spend these moments with you guys as we uh, unpack this story. Uh, contextually, as we uh, are journeying through Mark, uh, we, uh, here's where we are in the story. Uh, it's Holy Week. And uh, it's the week just a few days before the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, to remind you of where Jody had us last week, uh, the story that has become uh, known, famously known as the triumphal entry, and Jody has renamed that the humble entry uh, or the donkey ride as Jesus comes into Jerusalem on uh, the cult of a donkey, fulfilling um, his mission as our suffering servant. Uh, also, as Jody pointed out last week, uh, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, specifically prophecy in Zechariah 9. And if I could just remind you of one uh, point, a really main point that Jody made last week, I think it's going to be really, really important for us as we come into today's passage is uh, the thought uh, and the visual of a donkey, a baby donkey actually, uh, a slow moving and small. And uh, that point that it was so uh, important for us uh, that Jody spoke of last week, giving access, Jesus moving slow, uh, low to the ground, giving access. There is an access that every single person has to Jesus. Uh, one of the things that I wrote down in my Bible uh, that uh, access Jesus on this donkey is not just for uh, the Jews right then, right there. Uh, it was for everyone forever. And so as we um, think about that today, I think that'll be important, this access. That everyone has access in this new way of grace uh, in Jesus. Um, so the passage last week, I want to remind you as well, verse 11 uh, this is at the very end of the passage. Uh, as a reminder, it says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went to the temple and he looked around at everything. Uh, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So he comes into Jerusalem on the donkey. He goes up to the temple. He looks around at everything, which will be important for us later to remember. Uh, and then he goes back with the disciples. It was getting late, and he goes back to this uh, small community called Bethany with the 12. I want to pull up a slide uh, so that you can see this a little bit more clearly. Um, as you look at this on your screen, Bethany is on the eastern kind of slope of the Mount of Olives, uh, about two miles or so from Jerusalem, uh, situated, the town situated on the well-traveled road to Jericho, which is just further east from Bethany. As you can see on the map, it goes Bethany and then up the slope to the Mount of Olives, Beth Page, and then uh, down into the Kidron Valley. And then that squiggly line there is uh, really the upslope up to the temple, which is on uh, Mount Zion, which we'll talk about uh, 
later as well. So that's just some kind of some physical context of Bethany. Scholars uh, believe that Bethany was really more like a neighborhood than an entire town. And the edges, as you can see, the edges of Bethany and Bethpage uh, reach uh, kind of reach to the Mount of Olives. So there's some physical context for you. Here's some other things about Bethany, just in terms of uh, biblical stories. Bethany is probably most well known uh, for being the hometown of Jesus's good friends, uh, Lazarus uh, and Mary and Martha. As you know, the story from John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus uh, from the dead. That happened in Bethany. Uh, also in Matthew chapter 26, it was a place that Mary uh, anointed Jesus's feet with perfume. And so they go into Jerusalem, the humble entry. They leave Jerusalem. They go back up and over the Mount of Olives, back down to Bethany. Uh, something else significant to know about uh, uh, Bethany that will be significant for us in our text today is that the name Bethany uh, is translated to mean house of figs. Uh, there are just many fig trees uh, in the area and that will carry some significance uh, for us uh, to understand and talk about as we work through our text. Okay, so at the beginning of Mark 11, again, Jesus goes into Jerusalem from Jericho. If you go back to Mark 10. Mark 10 ended with the story of Bartimaeus being healed of his blindness, and then he follows them, Jericho, Bethany, uh, from Mark chapter 10, and then he uh, gets uh, to Bethany, gets on the colt of a donkey. He makes his way to the temple. He looks around at everything, and then he heads back to Bethany for the evening because it was getting late to sleep. We don't know. Perhaps he's staying at Lazarus's house and Mary and Martha's house. Um, that's where the story picks up uh, for us today. So uh, I'm going to read uh, verses 12 to 25, and then we'll unpack this uh, together. Again, really, really, really important text for us in uh, growing and developing and finding rest and freedom and peace and joy in the new covenant that Jesus uh, brought to us. So verse 12, on the following day, following day after Jesus had been in Jerusalem in the humble entry, uh, they came from Bethany, come, they came from Bethany, they're heading back to Jerusalem, and Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it, any fruit on it. And when he came to it, Jesus found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So it was in leaf, but it wasn't the season for the fruit of the figs to be there. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Verse 15, and they came to Jerusalem. They had made their way up the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives through Bethpage, down the other, the western slope of the Mount of Olives, through the Kidron Valley into Jerusalem. And they entered the temple. And Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple, the buying and selling of animals for temple sacrifices, money changing hands, people buying um, sacrificial animals so that they could have atonement, the operation of the temple sacrificial system. And Jesus is driving all of that out. And he overturned the tables of the money changers. There's a lot of corruption that went on uh, in this whole process, a lot of minimization, a lot of manipulation. And Jesus is overturning the tables and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Quite a scene. Uh, it, it's the, the temple is the core reality of, of life in Jerusalem. A lot of people, a lot of things happening. This is quite a scene that's happening here in this uh, holy temple. And he was teaching them, verse 17, he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, 
my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. That's an important thing to remember, perhaps underline all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers, speaking to those who were in leadership there, who, who were uh, operating the money changing tables and performing all the things that happened in this old covenant sacrificial system that's happening in the temple. You have made it a den of robbers and the chief priests and the scribes heard it. These are the people in leadership. They heard Jesus saying these things and he, they, they saw him or they heard of him doing these things. They heard it and they were seeking a way to destroy him or to kill him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished. Some translations say amazed. The crowds were astonished. They were amazed. The leadership was seeking a way to destroy him and kill him. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So evening came again, and then they, Jesus and the disciples move out of the city. And they go back to Bethany. Verse 20, and as they passed by in the morning, it's the next morning, it's the next day, and they're passing by the next morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. The previous day when Jesus made that declaration to the fig tree, it's a day later. Remember, the fig tree was in full leaf. 24 hours or so later, they see that this fig tree was withered away to its roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them. He's speaking to the disciples. Have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. Believe and receive. Believe that you have received it and it will be yours or it will be done for you. Verse 25, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. For if you have anything against anyone so that your father who also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. This is uh, the word of God for us this morning. Really uh, familiar passage to most of us. Um, something that we have um, read probably multiple times before. And I would venture to say that most of us probably have never truly understood what is actually going on here with Jesus in the temple and this whole reality of the fig tree. And so it's some interesting stuff to talk about. I think it's pretty confusing, even perhaps puzzling at first glance, at first read. We probably would look at this and go, is Jesus just having a bad day here? He curses a fig tree. He's overturning tables. I mean, what is going on? Like, what's up? Is Jesus just like losing, losing it with his anger? Like, what is going on here? There's this innocent fig tree and leaf. I mean, it's just a fig tree. And then it has to pay the price. Um, what is going on? Well, I hope uh, as we unpack this uh, that any confusion or any puzzling uh, thoughts that you might have about this passage would go away and that you would truly understand uh, this passage as the grace of Jesus being displayed, the, the coming of the new covenant and the ending of the old covenant covenant. Here is a really the, the main point that I want to say at the beginning, and then we're going to unpack this so that we can understand this more fully. Uh, this passage is a prophetic declaration, and not just a prophetic declaration, but also actions of Jesus in the temple signifying the end of the temple sacrificial system based on the old covenant Mosaic law. That is what is going on here as Jesus begins uh, to inaugurate in Holy Week his death and resurrection, the new covenant 
of grace. This really is about the ending of the old covenant mosaic system and the temple sacrificial system. The narrative, as you Uh, as we read together, as you see, flows with this fig tree incident, kind of sandwiching this story, uh, this action that happens in the temple. And so what we need to do is we need to look at all of this together because it's all uh, intertwined. We don't need to separate the fig tree story from the temple story because it's all connected. And so interpreting either in isolation from one another uh, really, I think, can lead us in the wrong direction and understanding what's going on here. So we're, we're going to look at it all together because it's all inter- intricately incli- um, uh, intertwined, but we're going to start with the temple incident first, and then we're going to talk about the fig tree uh, symbolism second. So the temple incident is verses 15 to 19. Uh, and in your, in your Bible, and this is something that we've uh, been doing um, over the last few weeks is we've been really finding some clarity and kind of renaming some of these um, headings that aren't scripture, but translators put these headings in scripture. Uh, And your heading probably says, mine says Jesus, says right above verse 15, it says Jesus cleanses the temple. And I'm going to invite you to do this. Jody invited us to do this last week. We renamed the triumphal entry as the humble entry. Uh, And we're going to rename this, not Jesus cleansing the temple. We're going to name this Jesus denouncing the temple Uh, because that's what's going on here. It's not, this isn't Jesus cleansing the temple. He's not out to reform the temple here. This isn't about reformation. Jesus is denouncing the temple by his actions. He is communicating that it is coming to an end. Uh, This is not about Jesus returning the temple to some type of more pure form of worship. Uh, In Mark chapter 2, if you remember the story of uh, the four friends who bring Jesus, he's in the town of Capernaum, and they bring the friends and they lower uh, Jesus through the roof. Uh, You might remember that story, Uh, and Jesus pronounces uh, forgiveness, and then he heals the the paralyzed uh, man, and he walks out, and by Jesus pronouncing forgiveness in that story, he is totally bypassing the sacrificial requirements of the law for people to have atonement and forgiveness. So part of the reality of Jesus' ministry has been preparing the way all throughout the Gospel of Mark for this moment when Jesus is going to denounce the temple and the sacrificial system. In a matter of days, because we're in Holy Week, Jesus will replace the tables of money, the money-changing tables in the temple where money is changed hand and people are buying animals Uh, to pay for their own atonement. Jesus will replace the money tables in the temple with the Lord's table. It would just be a few days later in the upper room in Jesus in uh, John 13 to 16. Uh, The Lord's table. What's significant about the Lord's table and how is it different from the money tables in the temple? That Jesus is the offering of Jesus, his offering, offering his life, his sacrifice would be a once for all sacrifice that no one would have to pay for their own atonement. In fact, Jesus pays for the atonement for everyone, his offering paying for our free forgiveness. This story is about Jesus ushering in a radical new way, which we understand as the new covenant of his grace. Again, it's not about him cleaning the temple up. This is about Jesus ending it totally. The temple's glory days are coming to an end. And it is really massive for the people that were there, that were listening to him teach. Some historical context so that you can better understand how massive of a shift this was. Uh, At this time in history, uh, the temple in Jerusalem, again, the temple is built on Mount Zion. 
The temple in Jerusalem was the central institution of Israel's religious and economic life. Everything in Judaism revolved around the temple. Uh, It was the central bank. Uh, It was the only megachurch. It was everything for everyone. And it was wrought by corruption in both the religious reality and in the economic and the political reality of the day. Josephus, the uh, infamous first century Jewish historian, calls Ananias, who was the high priest uh, at this time in history, uh, Josephus calls him the great procurer of money. The money tables, again, uh, market for birds and Pigeons and animals to sacrifice in a temple cult was vital for its operation. And this is, again, how people were paying for their atonement or paying for their forgiveness. There was hierarchy, extreme hierarchy in the temple. There was minimization of the poor and the Gentiles. Their minimization, it was rampant. Uh, Gentiles could not even enter the temple proper and had to stay in what was known as the outer courts. There were literally warning signs if you were a Gentile in the outer courts of the temple warning you not to move further in. Uh, And if you did, the signs would say uh, it was warning of the penalty of death. So for Jesus to do what he did here and to attack something so holy and so massive took enormous courage but also, I think more importantly, enormous clarity of his mission for his life and his work to replace the temple. So let's look at, I want to highlight this verse, uh, Mark 11, 17, from our passage. So Jesus goes and he's uh, overturning the money tables and he's driving people out and then he begins to teach, verse 17. And Jesus began to teach them and he declared this prophetic declaration. And he says, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? This is a quote from Isaiah 56, 7. And then he says, but you, and he's speaking to the leaders, to the chief priests and the scribes. He's speaking to all those in leadership. And he's saying, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he quotes a passage from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. I want to unpack these two uh, Old Testament prophetic uh, words that Jesus brought into his teaching here. Uh, to help us understand what's going on here. So the first thing on the Isaiah quote, uh, Jesus is fulfilling this radical inclusivity of prophecy. The, The Isaiah 56, this prophecy of radical inclusivity for all nations. And Jesus is saying, I am fulfilling that prophecy right here, right now. I would encourage you to write down Isaiah 56, one through eight and go back and read that Uh, later uh, after our time together. It is a promise of God's salvation for all people. And yet the temple at this time, when Jesus is denouncing the temple, at this time that it, it, it it was a national shrine for Israel only. It had become this place of extreme exclusivity And Jesus's actions here are condemning that exclusivity and he is declaring that it is for all nations, that his work, what he has come to do is bring a way of salvation for all people. The Jeremiah quote on the den of robbers, Jesus is saying, he's declaring that the same abuses that were happening back in the time of Jeremiah uh, are happening right here in Mark chapter 11. Uh, Write down Jeremiah 7, 1 through 15. I would encourage you to go back and read that full passage later as well. Jeremiah in that passage calls out the wickedness of Israel who believed that they were safe in the temple but were doing detestable things outside of the temple. 
And Jesus' reference to the temple being a den of robbers is denouncing the same hypocrisy and false security that Jeremiah denounced in Jeremiah 7. When you think about the den of robbers, a den is a place that robbers retreat to. It's a place that they would go and retreat to after committing their crimes. That's what a den of robbers means. And Jesus is bring, bringing judgment upon the corruption and upon the leaders of the temple by calling them a den of robbers. Let's look at Jeremiah seven eleven. Uh, this is what the prophet Jeremiah says, this is what Jesus is pulling in in his denunciation. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? And then it says, but I, but I have been watching, declares the Lord. I see your hypocrisy. I see the, um, the inauthenticity of what you proclaim to be true. Remember what happened the day before, Mark eleven eleven, and we just read that passage a few minutes ago. Jesus went to the temple and looked, looked around at everything. Jeremiah 7, I have been watching. Mark eleven eleven looked around at everything. And in seeing it all, Jesus comes back the next day and announces God's judgment and denounces the reality of what's happening in the temple. Again, this story is not about Jesus having a bad day and reacting or responding in anger. That's not what this story is. This story, this narrative is about all the realities of the temple sacrificial system coming to an end. And when Jesus uh, does these actions, and he makes the declarations that he makes. We see the response of the people and of the chief priests that were there that day. What does it say about how the people responded? In verse 18, it says they were astonished or they were amazed. This isn't an astonishment and an amazement in the sense of agreement. Uh, this is amazed or an astonishment in the sense of disbelief and shock. They could not believe what they were hearing and seeing Jesus do about this sacred, holy temple. And what did the religious leaders understand? They understood that Jesus was denouncing the temple and what they were doing there. Uh, in, in, uh, in the same verse, they, were, they began looking for a way to destroy him or kill him in response to what Jesus was saying and doing. Why? Because Jesus wasn't there cleansing the temple. He wasn't there seeking to be about reformation. Jesus here is about temple denunciation. And you don't speak and you don't act against such a sacred thing as the holy temple without ticking a whole lot of religious people off. Here, here's what this is. Jesus is heralding in this story the new covenant of grace. He is saying the temple reality is over. Now God's salvation comes through me. I, Jesus is saying, I am replacing the temple. And these are the realities when we come to these texts that we have to understand and learn and grow. And these are the things that we have to learn and understand and grow in and then teach to people, to teach the people that we're discipling, to teach these things to our children that no longer will there be daily sacrifices needed in the temple because Jesus is forthcoming in a matter of days. Sacrifice on the cross would be a once for all, Hebrews 10 tells us, a once for all sacrifice for all time, for all people, for all the nations. Not for all people who come to Zion, to the temple, to pay for their own atonement, but for all people who come to Jesus and his once for all sacrifice. It is the death of Jesus that brings free forgiveness and reconciliation to God. It is the resurrection life 
of Jesus that brings us a life of peace and hope and joy. This, this story is about amazing grace, church. This story is about grace upon grace. This story is about the old is gone and the new has come. That is what is happening in this story. And so in light of this, in light of this, uh, the fig tree incident that sandwiches the temple incident uh, is understood as a, sim- a, a symbol, it's symbolic of Jesus's prophetic proclamation and action. The fig tree is a symbol of the temple. So that's what we got to understand. The fig tree in this story is symbolic of the prophetic actions and teaching of Jesus uh, in the temple. And Again, Bethany, fig trees. Uh, Trees were frequently used as symbols throughout the Old Testament. If you think about Isaiah 61 and this hopeful prophecy talking about people that trust in God, you will be called an oak, an oak of righteousness. Psalm 1 talks about the roots of a tree being centered and growing. And so, so trees are, are used often as symbols throughout the Old Testament. And so Jesus, using the fig tree here, uh, would make total sense to the disciples as he's teaching them uh, about this denunciation. So what I want to do is point out two things about this symbolic tree in this town of Bethany. Verse 14, Jesus makes the statement, may no one eat fruit from you again. The barren tree represents the barrenness of the temple's sacrificial system. So in other words, may no one trust in this old covenant temple system again. May no one go to the temple and pay for their, own sac- for their own sacrifice and their own forgiveness again. May no one eat fruit from you again. And then in verse 20, uh, it's the next day, they saw the fig tree wither from its roots. So we're talking about a 24 hour period right here. It was in full leaf the day before. And in 24 hours later, this tree in full leaf is now withered away to its roots. You guys, this is a miracle. This is this 24 hour period of this tree withering is miraculous. And Jesus, again, is not about cleansing the temple. He is miraculously ending the temple by the miracle of his own death and resurrection. Everything in the kingdom of God must now shift away from the temple and fully and completely to Jesus. The way of the law is done and the way of grace has come. And that is what Jesus will begin to teach the disciples in verses 22 to 25. Because Peter is the one that says, look, the tree, it's withered away to its roots. And so Peter asks the question, and Jesus will teach them about the new covenant. Remember everything that we learned in Mark chapter 10. The disciples still at this point didn't have a full revelation of who Jesus was and what he came to do uh, as Messiah. They, they were not calling him Rabboni, Lord, Master, like Bartimaeus did uh, in Mark 10. They were calling him Didasco or Teacher. And so they, they needed to be disciple. They needed to learn and grow and understand what was going on here in the temple and what was going on here with this fig tree. They knew that it was different than it was before, but they still didn't yet understand what a radical of a shift. They could not have imagined that Jesus was declaring that the temple sacrifices and the temple itself would end and literally wither away. And so Jesus in these three verses explains here that this new way of grace is centered on two simple and powerful realities. It is simple on faith and it is centered on free forgiveness. 
The new radical way of Jesus centered on faith, centered on free forgiveness. The salvation is shifting from the temple and what you must do to Jesus and what he was about to do once for all for the whole world. If you remember three times up to Mark 11, Jesus has already predicted in the gospel of Mark his death and his resurrection. And so faith in Jesus is the new way and the only way to God. Faith in his once for all sacrifice for free forgiveness for everyone. Here, here's Jesus' words in verses 22 and 23. Jesus says to the disciples, have faith in God. Believe, trust, faith. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes and receives that what they say will happen it will be done for them the new way the new covenant of grace is not about rules and regulations and paying for animals to be sacrificed in the temple for atonement. The new way of grace is not centered on a holy place. The new way of grace is centered on the person and the work of Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 56, uh, earlier, uh, Jesus had just quoted this in the temple. It speaks of a holy mountain in that passage. And we've said already Uh, this morning that the temple was built on the Mount of Zion. And so it's interesting if you'll notice here in this passage, uh, Jesus doesn't say to mountains. He doesn't say if anyone says to mountains. He says if anyone says to this mountain. Uh, I, I believe that Jesus is saying to the disciples, this mountain, specifically speaking to Mount Zion, that the temple is built upon. If someone looks at this mountain, speaking of Zion, and you believe and receive this new covenant of grace, this mountain will end. This will go away. It will be thrown into the sea. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Not literally like a physical mountain being crumbled and thrown into a sea, but the, the symbolism of the mountain of the temple in Mount Zion, that that is ending, believe and receive this new way of me and it will be done for them. And I think the key word here is believe. Jesus has already said, have faith, faith in God. And then he says, uh, do not doubt in your heart, but believe. You know, I'm a big fan of underlining and boxing. I would encourage you to underline and box around, have faith in God and believe. You must believe and not doubt that the old covenant temple sacrificial system uh, is done. Believe that it's done. Believe that it's over. And I am ushering in a radical new way of inclusivity for all nations who simply believe and receive, have faith and trust in God, and believe that my work on the cross for you, uh, once for all, is free forgiveness for all who come to believe and receive it. This is good news, and I hope and pray. Uh, that this is connecting with you and uh, that you're understanding more fully what's going on here in this passage. Um, In spite of the immensity of the power and the perceived holiness of this holy temple, it would be destroyed both spiritually and physically. That is the prophetic declaration and action of Jesus in this story. Spiritually, A few days later, Jesus is on the cross of Calvary and Jesus utters these words, it is finished. And in that moment, the curtain, this thick four inch curtain, this huge curtain that was at the very epicenter of the temple, the holy of holies was ripped from top to bottom. No more holy of holies in the temple. Now the holy presence of God rests in each person by the power of the Spirit of Christ in us. And so spiritually, the holy temple would be 
destroyed, but also physically. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus predicts due to the disciples uh, this physical destruction of the temple that no no stone of it would be unturned. And this happened in AD 70. Rome came through and they bulldozed the whole thing. And so by the time that Mark actually wrote his gospel, the temple, the physical temple is either being besieged or it is already totally destroyed. It's not, it's not about a holy place anymore, but it's about God's holy presence being everywhere by the spirit of Christ in each person as they believe and receive the person and the work, the, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus on our behalf. A relationship with God is based simply and powerfully on faith and free forgiveness. This is the gospel. Jesus had been paving the way for this denunciation throughout its, his ministry. And in our text today, Jesus, by his words and by his actions, he denounces the temple and he is saying, I am replacing the temple. The new covenant of grace replaces the old covenant of law. Jesus, in his radical inclusivity, replaces exclusivity. All have access, all are welcome. This is the good news of Jesus. Have faith in God. If anyone believes and they receive, it will be done for them. What will be done for them? You have radical access to God. That's what would be done. You have free forgiveness in Jesus simply by believing and receiving Jesus and the work uh, for you and for me and for everyone. This is, this is what is going on here. This is the good news that Jesus came to give us. Clarity of mission to set captives free. Amen. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, these are important things for us to understand here today in a, a passage of scripture that for many of us has been, if we're honest, confusing and puzzling for us. And so I pray, Lord, that in our time together today that there has been a clarity for us about what really is going on here. This is Jesus uh, declaring um, the ending of the old law and the inauguration of the new way of grace and freedom that we have uh, in, in Jesus and in his work, in his cross and in his resurrection. We have been liberated. So I pray, Lord, that as people uh, have been stirred by the gospel, Lord, that they would have faith in you, that they would believe and not doubt. And Lord, that you would bring to them an, uh, an awakening to hope and love and joy and freedom uh, in their lives as they ponder uh, your word. May it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're seeing uh, another uh, song together. Uh, and as we do that, uh, I encourage you where you're watching and listening to uh, come to the Lord's table. It's not a money table. It is the table of grace. It is free for you. The body of Jesus broken, the blood of Jesus shed so that you would know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Your freedom has been bought by Jesus himself and he invites you to be forgiven and free. And as you respond in worship with uh, free will offerings, you can do that online or you can send those into our P.O. box. Let us respond to the word now uh, in worship. I see heaven invading this place. I see angels praising your holy name. I sing praises, I sing praises, give you honor, worthy Jesus. And I see glory falling in this place. And I see hope soared the healing of all disease. And I sing praises, I 
sing praises, give you honor, worthy praise. Do we give you praise and all of the honor? You are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise, all of the glory, God. Do we give you praise and all of the honor? All the glory and honor is yours, God. You deserve it. We give it to you today. All the glory. Everything good in our lives. Lord, it's because of you. All the glory is yours. We love you. We're thankful for you this morning.